Good afternoon, everyone. Tractor Man 44 here. Um, I thought I'd better clarify at the beginning of this video that um, uh, things get a little bit uh, out of sequence, a little discombobulated. Um, I think I've already shown you servicing the sediment bowl and getting the sediment bowl off cleaned up and then fired the tractor up. So that's already been done. And it was running fine as long as I didn't really have it under load. And I had it in the shop running it and, and uh, just starting up the, the, the saw for the first time. But I took it out to the woodshed and, and uh, I pulled the throttle back on the thing and it started bucking and carrying on. And uh, it was not satisfactorily uh, running at all. So I went ahead and cut one little piece or maybe two or three cuts and it was just bucking so bad. I shut it down, put the tractor in the shed and pulled the carburetor off and uh, you know to, to order me a carburetor kit, boil it out and uh, uh, put in a whole, whole replacement kit or whatever parts of stuff I need uh, in the carburetor to get it leveled out. So I apologize if it, it kind of seems like things are a little out of sequence. That's, they are out of sequence and that's my fault. Uh, I really had to get the tractor running to make sure that that would be the one that would run uh, good enough you know to put that rig on and uh, and like I say, I, I just got to run and didn't really get it fine-tuned. But uh, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm waiting on a carburetor kit now. I did have to order a, a complete rebuild kit. So if I'm thinking right, I'm figuring the tail end of this uh, this little video here is gonna be um, disassembling the carburetor possibly and throwing it in my in my ultrasonic parts washer. But anyway, that's where it probably should end because obviously I don't have all the parts to put everything back together. So. Uh, on to another project in the meantime. Now on the back end of these old tractors, uh, some of them had a inch and three eighths six spline par takeoff. Some of them had an inch and an eight six spline par takeoff. And to use inch and three eighths powered equipment, you had to put adapters on. They had multiple or mul di several different kinds of adapters. This one here is an extension adapter where you'll actually gain just about this much length whenever you slide that adapter on. Then there's another one called the flush adapter, which is what I always used on this, on this right angle drive. This by way, uh, by chance happens to be a, a Massey Harris, uh, MHF, Massey Harris Ferguson right angle drive. And it is also a three eighths, uh, six spline, but I only had an inch and eighth coming out of there. So the answer at that point was to use the old, um, flush adapter. Now I can no longer use this cause well, it broke first time you use it, but you just leave it in there and the grease will hold it in place and it just creates the uh, the shim, so to speak, or the bushing. And uh, you can use it for years and years and years. But since the last time I've had it on there, probably 15 years ago, I managed to lose a couple of the pieces so I can no longer use that. And you can see why that was uh, so weak. Um, <laughs> because it changed from an inch and an eighth, inch and three eighths, which is just a very little bit uh, of meat left in between those uh, splines. Then there's another type which is just a very slight um, uh, extension. It's going to go in here, it's going to go up inside there, and I'm thinking that I'm going to be able to use that right directly onto this guy here. What I might have to do will be to change these uh, bushings that I've got here and actually bush it out just a little bit farther to compensate for that a little bit more of a uh, length because it's got just exactly, well, five eighths of an inch more in length for me to deal with. So uh, hopefully that'll take care of it. Um, but I don't know, I'm gonna have to clean this up, pull this guy off of here, slide this guy on, lubricate it all up, and then pop these off of here, slide the right angle drive on, and see how close I come to, to matching up with what I need. Uh, I don't know, I haven't seen these for a while. Hopefully I can still get these if I absolutely have to. But I really am gonna try this slight, this short extension adapter first. <clears throat> As it turns out, I'm going to have to uh, pull these studs out and install replacement studs approximately 5 eighths of an inch longer. That's probably the simplest thing mechanically that I can do um, to, make this, uh, to make this function the way I need it to function. <clears throat> so I'm just going to put a set of lock nuts on here real quick and then back those studs loose. Sometimes you can get real lucky. These look like they're going to be reasonably loose. Yeah, see how nice that is? Just put them double nuts on there and lock them down against one another and you can uh, usually back them off like that. I 
I could back these out a little bit. They had about that much meat in there. But by the time I do that, I've only got about that much left totaled in. I don't really want to put that much strain on the housings and all that. So I'll just go ahead and get four replacements, five-eighths of an inch longer. Not a big deal. Well, as the old saying goes, the best laid plans of uh, mice and men sometime go awry. Uh, I couldn't come up with studs. Didn't have any studs uh, in town, the local fasten-all store, you know. They're my ace in the hole. They always got what you need. Uh, they let me down today. So what I done, I come back in the uh, in the shop and I got to digging around some of the old uh, boxes out of the blacksmith shop from the old man's play back on the farm, you know, and uh, come up with some some uh, some bolts long enough where I'm gonna I'm gonna cut wrinkles on them all the way down as far as I can, and that's gonna give me my roughly three and seven eighths inches what I need uh, in order to to make this a success. So it's it's gonna be harder than a grade two. These are old bolts. Hell, they're they're square head. Hell, they're probably close to 100 years old or probably at least 80, 90 years old. And um, and uh, at any rate, they're, they're a good enough quality where they're going to suffice. I will promise to uh, give me some studs eventually, pop that right angle drive off, put those in correctly. But at any rate, to make a long story short, we're going to go ahead and cut wrinkles on them all the way down. This is a uh, Greenfield Little Giant uh, set of tap and dies that also came out of the blacksmith shop. I use these things many, many, many times whenever I was a kid, making repairs on farm equipment with the old man. Goes real good till you get down to where there ain't no wrinkles. Now it ain't gonna be easy, because once you get down there where the head interferes with the bottom of the of the uh, the die, that's where the problem comes in. I don't like to not back them up. A lot of times you see guys cutting threads and they'll just turn and turn and turn, won't hardly lubricate. I've seen guys actually cutting the threads and wouldn't lubricate anything at all. You know, that's a, that's the death of your threads and it's the death of your uh, your die or tap if you're using a, uh, a tap. So uh, you want to use plenty of lubrication and back it up. When you back it up, it allows the chunks to fall out of those, uh, out of the teeth in there in that die. But you're getting a rough idea of what we got to do. I could probably chuck this up in a lathe and spend a half hour setting everything up, you know, cut them wrinkles in all the way down. But uh, yeah, this would be good enough. And I don't buy this fancy thread cutting foam here. I had a buddy of mine recently passed away, and uh, I ended up with some stuff out of his shop, and he liked having all the good stuff, so. I got a, a lot of that kind of, that kind of stuff. So anyway, you got the idea. Okay, so here's the right angle drive actually installed on the back of the tractor. I was really going to uh, take the time and film it, uh, but I was going to go ahead and set it on there and dry fit it. And it was such an aggravation to hold that thing away, it's probably 40 pounds up in place and hold my spacers in place, get that all in there and um, get in my, my newly made studs. And um, once I got it going, I said, you know what? I ain't taking it back apart. I just kept going and, uh, and just finished it up. But anyway, any rate, there's a couple of things to note. I did have to take the stabilizing chains off of the uh, left side because that is going to interfere right here with the pulley. Now I got enough clearance as long as I run like a six inch belt and run it, you know, like right on the center of the pulley. It's not going to uh, to give me a problem over there. But um, that was uh, that was a little surprise. I, I'd forgotten that when I had this on in the past. I did not have that on. I just left it hang down like the chain or tied it off on with wire. But uh, I went ahead and put that on there because I needed that little bit of a space uh, for a spacer. But at any rate, I had to extend that out to compensate for that uh, that um, short extension power takeoff adapter from inch and eighths to inch and three eighths and so instead of going to a lathe and cutting and making bushings and everything I determined that uh, I could put a washer here use that uh, that stabilizing bar uh, fitting a washer and a, a, a seven eighths nut gave me exactly what I needed to make up the difference for the long adapter uh, so that was the quickest simplest and, uh, and and stable way of doing it now I do have to take this all off whenever I get replacement studs uh, but I'll have to order those in 
and that is a low priority this is going to work just fine uh, everything matches up perfectly I don't know if you can see all the way through that hole but uh, you can see that hole on the fire takeoff shaft right there uh, that lets you know that the uh, the adapter is in perfect alignment with the original inch and eighth shaft uh, so I don't have to worry about it it's actually bottomed out inside the the right angle drive I can feel it um, a bottom out in there and uh, it's, it's going to work just fine so now that we got that on there, it's um, it's time to hook on to the to the saw rig. I did not do anything to that carburetor. Remember, I just did the sediment bowl. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that carburetor off. I think it needs a good a good thorough cleaning. Like I said, this tractor was vandalized at a buddy of mine's uh, property way way out in the country, and the uh, radiator was stolen. The uh, sheet metal was all beat off of it. I think I told you guys that earlier in, uh, in the video a couple, three, four days ago or so when I first got this thing running. But they had stolen a lifting arm off the back. They just literally took a, uh, an axe and just beat the sheet metal completely off of it and smashed the steering wheel. The steering wheel was busted all the way down around the cowl. The gauges were all busted out of it. And... Uh, it was left for dead right out in the middle of the woods. A buddy of mine gave it to me and my brother who's uh, older than I am by about 12 years uh, he's always had a seemed to always find more time in a day than I've got. Rebuilt the engine for me because it had laid open and gotten water in it. It was locked up. Carburetor's mm -hmm. never been touched from the time we uh, by time I, from the time I brought it home from his house. It's never been touched. Okay. Sure is a sweet looking sediment bowl though, ain't it? But the inside of that carburetor is going to be nasty. I'm sure the, uh, the jet's probably going to, well, I'm going to put it in a, in an ultrasonic parts washer and uh, it's going to shine like a newborn baby's butt when I get done with it. Or if it don't, I'll lie about it. What the heck. So I'm going to take it in the shop and put it in the parts cleaner. Come back to it tomorrow. I don't know how many of you guys work on this old junk. A good percentage, I'm sure. Um, these old carburetors get pretty nasty. Um, tell you what, I come up with a, a deal. I worked for a clock shop way back a long time ago fixing air conditioner. And they turned me on to uh, ultrasonic parts washers. And so I've been using those for about the last 10 years or so. They, uh, Here's a, a jet inside here, of course. It won't hardly back out, and I don't want to take a chance of rounding it off. But once you run it for, you know, a few minutes in your ultrasonic cleaner, that thing will just pop out of there just like nothing. And it'll just clean these things just, just tremendously. And uh, all the other parts and pieces, all those little uh, passages down inside the carburetor, man, it just, it just knocks all that stuff completely clear, completely out of it. Just does a phenomenal job. Um, and I've got all the... The rest of the uh, the air and the main the main adjustments the nozzles all that's laying down inside here um, you always want to if you use this chem dip you always want to make sure you um, get all the rubber pieces and all the fiber pieces especially the rubber pieces get that out of there because it'll swell up about five times its normal size and uh, it ain't gonna be any good so if you have any rubber pieces that you need to reuse uh, like the the tip on the um, on your needle valve and things like that. You definitely want to pull that out of there. Look at all this scum. I know when I when I uh, pulled over to the wood pile, I made one or two cuts. The motor started loping real bad and everything, so I knew that I was going to have to clean the carburetor. Uh, you, so it's like, yeah, you know, just bite the bullet. Put it back in the shed, shut it off, and uh, went ahead and pulled it off, and we're going to go ahead and clean all this off of there. But at any rate, this is what I do like to use. This is my favorite favorite carburetor cleaner uh, this is a Berryman Kim dip carburetor and parts cleaner I'm gonna go ahead and fill that thing up and turn it on and show y'all the end result well as far as I'm concerned um, you can't do a better uh, better combination on these carburetors um, other than this Kim dip this uh, Kim dip and a uh, ultrasonic parts washer uh, I know you saw that whenever I put those in there uh, I'm gonna take this and clean this with carburetor cleaner blow it off with the air compressor and uh and then show y'all but take a look at those uh those nozzles absolutely incredible this has a a warming function you can actually warm the whatever whatever fluid you put in here at the same time that it uh 
it ultrasonically uh, vibrates. So this has actually turned out very, very, very good. Now that stuff is the devil on paint. That paint. But you can see we can read all the numbers now. Uh, we can see all the, the passages appear to be fairly good. But I'm going to stick uh, stick those things under the air compressor nozzle. And we're going to go about the business of cleaning that up and putting a fresh new kit in that thing. You know, I continuously say in my, uh, in my videos, uh, these ain't how-to videos. This is just how I do videos. Uh, I don't do everything right. I'll be the first to admit it. But at any rate, one thing that you probably really should consider, though, when you're handling these chemicals like this uh, carburetor cleaner, that's a pretty strong chemical, pretty stout chemical. Uh, don't do like I do. You probably should wear rubber gloves or wear them and throw them away. Um, I, I completely forget about them, you know. Again, I just, I probably should put them on there. It's probably going into my liver and going <laughs> to, ain't going to let me live to a ripe old age just because I'm messing with all these chemicals without putting my gloves on. So like I said, don't do as I do. And don't do as I say, you probably should protect yourself from these chemicals. <laughs> At any rate, uh, <laughs> for now, um, this is Tractor Man 44, and I'm out of here until the, until the next video when I put the carburetor back together.